Super. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, my name is Peter Davidson. I'm the general counsel of the Commerce Department. And uh, I'm grateful to be here today with two superstars from the Trump administration, Andre Yanku, who is the um, director of the Patent and Trademark Office, and Macon Delrahim is the assistant attorney general for antitrust. Um, I'm actually truly pleased and not just reading talking points because um, I've known Macon for many years uh, in many different uh, twists in our careers in Washington. And I've always known him to be one of the most thoughtful and uh, uh, with the most amount of credibility um, and kind of intellectual uh, clarity of many folks I've worked with. So it's a pleasure to have him here today as well. Andre I've only known for a little over a year now, but uh, he is doing a spectacular job with the Patent and Trademark Office. Um, newcomer to Washington, uh, he has hit the ground running and is just doing fantastic work over at PTO. So we have just under an hour to go through about seven hours of topics. Um, and I'm really excited to, uh, to dive into this because I love uh, this area. And I think we have a very unique opportunity here with the Department of Justice and the Department of Commerce here uh, to talk about some of these cutting edge issues. So I would also like to, to thank the telecommunications and intellectual property working groups of the Federal Society do terrific work and encourage you all to join them. Um, so if, you, if you'd like to join, you can raise your hand right now. Brian will walk around with a <laughs> sign-up sheet. Um, but anyway, they do terrific work. So um, thank, thank of you, thanks for all of you to be here. So what, what we're going to do is going to start out. Um, I am going to throw some questions out to, uh, to Andre and Macon. And we're going to do that for the first part of the session. And then I'm going to turn it over to you. So, uh, in the next uh, half an hour or so, if you can be thinking of uh, stimulating questions to ask, um, we'll have some good opportunity for some back and forth since we have a, a, um, a good sized room here. So first of all, I, I think, and what I'll do is I'm gonna actually throw the question to one or, one or the other of these fellows, and then the other one should feel free to chime in as well if they'd like to do that. But Andre, I think I'm gonna start with you and say that a lot of people think about patents as um, kind of a monopoly or a quasi-monopoly for a period of time. Um, since we have someone who deals with monopolies here as well, but to start with you, is that the right way to think about how a patent works? And um, if, if not, what, how should we think about it? Yeah, so uh, thanks, Peter, and uh, thanks for the kind words. Uh, really great to be here with you. Fabulous working with you at uh, the Department of Commerce. Um, I should say that uh, uh, you're doing a phenomenal job holding the fort down on all the legal issues that come to the department. It's, uh, it's fantastic to have somebody uh, like you in that position. And Macon, it's been great working with you on IP issues. Both Macon and I have a lot in common. We both come from Los Angeles. Uh, and maybe during the rest of the day today, you can figure out all the other things we have in common. Um, but uh, uh, having several folks in the administration who are so knowledgeable about IP, in positions of uh, critical importance like Macon at the, at, at the DOJ is really important for, uh, for our IP and innovation ecosystem uh, for a whole host of reasons. Uh, to go straight to, uh, to Peter's question, uh, look, the, the bottom line is that uh, folks are throwing around the monopoly word uh, uh, quite loosely uh, in general and especially when it comes to patents, uh, people have this popular conception that uh, patents are monopolies. When they're kind, they say limited monopolies. Um, but uh, that's not how I think about it. Uh, I actually think that patents are, uh, are pro-competitive. Um, and uh, what, do, do, what do I mean by that? So a patent will give you a limited right for a, uh, for a limited period of time to, uh, uh, to, to uh, be the exclusive one who practices uh, or has the right to that particular approach to solving a particular problem. Uh, it doesn't give you a monopoly over the market. Uh, so uh, Macon will, is the expert here, but you know when I think about monopolies, I think about markets. Uh, patents don't do that. So uh, uh, what patents do do is A, force the inventor to disclose to the public so everybody knows about uh, the technology. and. Um, um, and 
if you prove the market, if, if you prove your product to be successful, others will look at it and they will say, gee, I want to be in that as well because you're doing really well. But I can't do it exactly the way you've done it because you've patented it. And people get temporarily kind of upset, like, mm, damn it, I really want to do that the way you do it. <laughs> but you can't. So what do you do? Because you've seen the disclosure, you've seen the market benefits, you are forced to do one better, to invent around and to create more technology. It's the exact opposite of the Middle Ages guild periods when everybody was keeping things as a trade secret and nobody was able to, 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 um, uh, to improve upon the technology and uh, uh, to, pro to, uh, to progress. What the patents have done, uh, they have democratized innovation and now uh, it has, as a result of the US patent system, we have created over the past couple of hundred years an explosion of innovation, the likes of which humanity has never known. Um, uh, and that is because they incentivize creation and improvements and additional creation and therefore more and more competition. So there's a recent uh, Supreme Court case, uh, oil states, uh, dealing with some of these bigger picture questions. Um, any thoughts on that? I thought you were not going to ask hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> Late, that's later. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so, so you're talking about the oil states case yes. uh, where the uh, court was dealing with, uh, with post-grant proceedings at the patent office the, which have been instituted by the AIA, the America Invents Act. But well, large, largely also explored what is, the, what is the nature of a patent in our system too. Uh, to some extent and they uh, have said that uh, patents in certain circumstances are public rights. Um, but the bottom line is, uh, if you're asking if patents are, is, is property um, uh, or not, um, I do think uh, the statutes and generally the law is pretty clear that patents uh, shall be treated as personal property. Um, there are a whole host of uh, rights that come along with a property right um, and patents have those characteristics. That does not mean that the government cannot review those rights, uh, correct mistakes it has made uh, in granting, uh, granting those rights, um, and the like. But time permitting, we can get more into the philosophy yeah, that's of... An, uh, that's, that's a, that's a, was it, anyway, for me, anyway, it's a fascinating discussion in the is. court. So, um, so Macon, um, you know, our system is a little different here in the United States than they may have elsewhere, but does our system of kind of div divided authorities, I don't know if that's the right way to say it, um, does that really create, um, you know, when we're talking about intellectual property and, and competition policy, is the result at the end of, end of the day kind of a consistent outcome, um, or does it kind of ping back and forth between the two, kind of depending on which is ascendant? Well, let me also just add my thanks to, and, and great pleasure to be with you and Andre here. Um, on the, and, and I think... Uh, Big kudos to the Federal Society for holding this uh, event, particularly with the executive branch. I think we periodically need to think critically and creatively about uh, the separation of powers, the executive branch and the proper you know, checks and balances we have rather than having you know, kind of a, 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 uh, a multi-headed fourth branch that rows around and nobody really knows which direction it's going, um, which gets me to the point of the division of power. When you're talking about division of power, I'm hoping you mean between patents and antitrust enforcement. Uh, in the best situation, they should be totally complementary. As uh, Andre said, I think patents are pro-competitive. They create what I would call dynamic competition. And so it's not so much, you know, we have whatever it is, you know, the technology called the chandelier, and you charge $100 per unit, and wouldn't it be great if you charge $90 per unit and uh, because it would be 10% cheaper for the consumer. Some people might view that the role of antitrust is to create competition in that. I think the role, the government's role of innovation policy broadly, combination of proper antitrust enforcement and patent policies is not so much to make that cheaper, although you, you know, you'd like it to be as cheap as possible uh, in the free market, but it is to create the next paradigm shifting invention 
the LED light, the, you know, the recess lighting or whatever it might be. It's a poor analogy. That's the best I could come up with looking up in the sky. But, you know, the LED, that's the next one because it, you know, it might use one hundredth of the energy that it uses. It could be ten times as bright and it could be a lot better. And you want to encourage that R&D in there. So that's where the consumer benefits because once that comes out, these guys will be forced not to go down 10 percent, but probably go down 90 percent and sell that. We've seen that in almost every areas of our lives, whether it's energy or communications technology or any other uh, field that, that we deal with. So the best of all situations is that they would be complementary in a way that actually enhances uh, dynamic competition and increases the incentive for R&D and investment. And I think, by and large, we've gotten it right in this country. So that was my uh, next question. So in practice, how does it work? Is there, is there coordination between these two areas uh, to create kind of a coherent policy? Or is it a regulatory state of nature where everyone is just kind of beating each other over the head with a, with a big stick? So you would hope that there's a good coordination. That's, you know, I think in the enforcement of the laws, uh, which, which we do at the Justice Department, or the, you know, the uh, procurement of patents and interpretation of the laws Congress writes, you hope that there's the predictability and the consistency because, you know, think individual freedom and business freedom relies on that consistency. So you hope it is. In this particular incident, I mean, people look at Andre and I um, and me and, and they think that somehow the administration coordinated a policy because we come from uh, certain viewpoints that there does not seem to be any fungus between us. Uh, and there's a lot of other similarities between us. He's much more handsome. But uh, we both, you know, at one point in our lives went to UCLA. We both lived in Los Angeles. Uh, we both married up. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, we both immigrated, uh, you know, one at 10, the other one at 13 from autocratic regimes. I think we get a sense of appreciation of the, the, the free markets and the opportunities that a country like this and a legal regime like this uh, provides. But neither of us, uh, I don't think, knew of each other, even though I think our offices in Century City were probably 50 yards away from each other. Neither of us knew each other before this administration, and it's just been an incredible pleasure by pure accident that uh, we both get to be in this job and do what we're doing. Well, that's good to know. I, well, I, I have this, some of the same, same things in com common with you all. I, I married up and married a Californian and immigrated from an oppressive regime, um, state of Minnesota. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> um, so we have something in common. But Andre, what, what, um, what do you have to say about this uh, coordination, cooperation versus regulatory state of nature? How, how does it work in practice? Uh, so uh, first of all, uh, obviously, we at the patent office, we come towards the front end of the innovation process, uh, making an antitrust, uh, they come somewhere towards the back end when the patents are already issued and companies um, uh, utilize them. So um, what we want to make sure that we do as one administration is that we have a coordinated policy to the extent uh, possible. So that we don't take positions on the front end that uh, the you know that uh, DOJ and others uh, on the back end uh, find untenable. So um, uh, and, and and vice versa. And I think um, I think that is important, uh, as Macon indicates. It's uh, stroke of luck, or I don't know what it is, but the stars align that we don't have that uh, problem here. Um, so, um, and, and I should say it's uh, generally true across the, uh, the uh, uh, Trump administration. It, um, and, and, and maybe it's not a stroke of luck. Uh, the folks who hired us in these positions, maybe they were looking for a particular thing. As you know, Peter, the Secretary of Commerce, for example, is uh, very much of the same mind when it comes to, uh, to IP policy. Uh, and it's not just me at the department who have uh, particular points of view. Uh, you look at uh, Walt Copan at, at NIST, um, 
who touches on these issues as well. So it's, it's really a broad-based uh, approach. And I think, uh, I think that, uh, generally speaking, is, is a very good thing. Okay, that leaves me all warm and fuzzy. Um, so, Macon, <laughs> let me turn to you and ask you, um, should competition policy ever overrule patent protections? And if so, in what case? So, you know, I think a case that we have some experience with coming from the Supreme Court is one where, uh, you know, private parties have abused the patent system through fraud and they procured a patent and its exclusionary rights that goes naturally with it uh, and with that have tried to, you know, co-opt a market. And that's one where we've recognized that, statutes later recognized it as a, uh, you know, in, in the world of patent misuse um, as well, but that's an area that it could be. So uh, patents don't grant antitrust immunity. However, exercising your statutory right that Congress has given with a patent, because without the exclusionary right, there is no patent, or copyright for that matter, or, tra you know, or, or trademarks. But exercising that right validly, unilaterally, cannot be and should never be an antitrust violation. I'm doing one of those rare things in Washington where an, an enforcer or regulator uh, takes away their own power rather than expand it, which is something that is typical, but it's one where I actually think it harms competition if we enforce the antitrust laws in a way that isn't aligned with the proper property rights. Now, two patent owners, I mean, as, as Andre explained earlier, even though you might be granted a limited monopoly, limited exclusionary right in a particular area, I'll give an, uh, a particular example that, that, that highlights this, it doesn't mean you have market power for the purpose of antitrust law. So even though you might have the patent on uh, Lipitor, the cholesterol lowering medication that some in this room, including myself, would take or we all have, know somebody who does, but at the same time, and Lipitor is off patent now, but you know, at the time that that was under patent, you also had Mevacor, you also had you know, uh, Crestor, and all sorts of, you know, about seven or so different statin uh, drugs that lowered cholesterol in the body. All of them were unpatent, under patent, because under that chemical entity, somebody couldn't directly copy that while under patent. However, they were all substitutes for each other. So a physician or a pharmaceutical benefit manager or whomever, insurer, could say, you know, Lipitor is no longer on patent, Crestor is, and you know, we're gonna ask your doctor to use Lipitor unless it, you know, it's not good for you. And so from an antitrust standpoint, we look at the market, we look at substitutes. In that particular example, even though they're all under patent, none of them have monopoly power because they have substitutes that removes that incentive for them to uh, engage in abusive practices. Okay. Uh, Andre, you mentioned uh, Walt Copan at NIST uh, in your last comment. Um, with rapidly changing technologies like AI, quantum, other things like that, um, do our existing tools and rules and systems work for those new emerging technologies, or do we need to look at some different and new ways to deal with, uh, deal with some of them, and, and a little bit of the you know, international economic competition might be relevant here too. So the general concepts are there, and the general concepts, is, if applied correctly, uh, should work, uh, but we have a lot of work uh, to do, actually, um, especially when it comes to artificial intelligence and machine learning and the like, when it comes to IP protections in these areas. And we are uh, working on those issues right now as we speak at the, uh, at the PTO. So I'll give you a few examples uh, about that. Um, so if you think about machine learning, um, hugely important for the next technological revolution, or as some people call it, the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, we're on the cusp of that now. Um, so first and foremost, it, we, we must make sure that that technology is patentable, patent eligible. The rest of the of the of the world, including Europe, China, and the and and the like, uh, the major jurisdictions have addressed this issue, have basically solved the issue. We are in the midst of struggling uh, with a question as to the eligibility of these types of technology, 
And um, uh, we have, uh, from the patent office point of view, we have just this year issued guidance uh, to, to, uh, to try to, um, to bring clarity to this area. And, and um, we'll see where we're going. But there is activity in Congress and courts on the same question. So really important for us to get this nailed down as quickly as possible. Second, when it comes to machine learning, there are some new things here that are happening that other technologies have not had. So for example, so machine learning, the way it works is you have a program, and then you have a data set. Um, and then you train the machine. And the more uh, iterations it runs, it learns, so self-learning. Uh, machine learning, and you don't know exactly how it does that. You don't know how it gets to the answer by definition. It's almost like a black box in some respects. With, pa with a patent system, uh, the traditional patent system is there's this quid pro quo. It's a very basic concept of patents. You disclose to the public how you achieve it, and in, in return, you get this limited exclusionary right. Well, if you don't know how the machine does it, what exactly are you disclosing? So this is a struggle that we need to figure out. Further, um, what if the machine learns and it creates new things? The machine creates new things. So the machine creates a new invention, for example. How do you patent that? Uh, you could potentially patent it. You first have to know how it does it, number one. Don't know. The machine has to go and file its. Uh... Well, OK, so who, who is the owner? Right. Who is the inventor? Right. So are they the machine? You put the machine down? Weird. Uh, is it the current owner of the machine? Or is it the original inventor and the original developer of that machine? So these are untested. Um, and I'll give, I'll give you one more example. There are many issues here that relate to IP and, 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 um, and the next technological revolution. I'll give you one more example, which is on data. The data sets are critically important for the advancement of artificial intelligence. And as a nation, for us to be able to keep pace with the rest of the world and actually keep leading in this area, the developers need access to the big data sets. Because the more data, the better the machine learns, the quicker it learns, and the like. The problem is, how do you protect? What's the IP protection? What's the form of protection for data? Patents don't cover just the data. You can't, the current patent law does, doesn't cover that. Uh, copyright law doesn't really cover compilations like that. So what companies are resorting to is trade secrets. They keep these data sets secret. And you see these companies guarding them like the crown jewels, right? Google guards its data set, Netflix, Amazon. These are like the most important secret things for the companies. So I can understand that and also good because of privacy considerations and all that. But from an IP point of view, um, because they're guarded, it's the, opposite, it's the opposite of a patent system where you're supposed to disclose. How are the other companies to develop their machine learning? So you think about a startup, new, new, new guys, small, without access to the big data sets. Um, so there is a question that's hotly discussed right now as to what forms of IP can we create, should we create? Uh, to incentivize uh, properly and carefully um, uh, data protection and, and, and development and, and usage. Well, that's, there's a whole other conversation I think we'd, I'd like to get back to a little bit later about you know, these, some of these important decisions that we're making, policy decisions. Uh, are other people internationally making decisions faster than we are, and are they setting standards that we need to get back to? But we'll get, that, we'll get to that in, in just a minute. Um, so, Macon, since uh, Joe Simons isn't here, this is your opportunity. Um, so, uh, are they part of the government? <laughs> <laughs> They're independent, whatever that means. I don't know. Um, so, uh, so Andre was just talking about new ru different rules and different ways of looking th at, at things to uh, make sure that we keep up with technology. What about our current jurisdictions within government today? Are those tooled correctly for the the next? You know, set of issues we're dealing with, whether it be AI, quantum, whatever you know, whatever it is. So you know, I was a little bit of a joke. Joe is a great friend. We've worked together for 20 years, and, and he's also a, actually doing a terrific job too. He's I doing mean, a he's fantastic very, job, very and is somebody who is very similarly, you know, uh, thinks about antitrust and markets the same way, and 
and a, and a great guy who wrote a, a very important paper on one of the concepts uh, of antitrust law about 20 years ago. But um, so we have a good working relationship with the Federal Trade Commission. You know, there's historic accidents why we have two agencies doing antitrust enforcement. Um, when I was on the Antitrust Modernization Commission that about 10 or so years ago, we issued a report, and a you know, bipartisan report. We looked at some of these issues, and one of the issues that was raised was um, in some areas of, uh, of industry, we have, you know, statutorily, they come to the antitrust division. Telecommunications, transportation, banking, um, you know, a lot of the old ICC cases, you'll see that common reference over there and not really accident that Congress was lazy and just picked up a certain set of laws and, uh, and said, hey, you guys deal with that. But there's a whole set of other areas in the industry that isn't that and how do the two agencies uh, you know, divide up the responsibilities? We generally work well. There's a, what's called a clearance agreement between the two and uh, we say you do this and we'll do this and it's based on some historic ex expertise that two agencies do. So, you know, pharmaceutical cases, uh, mergers will go to the Federal Trade Commission, gas station mergers goes there. Uh, you know, we do beer, uh, it's a lot more fun. Uh, but we do, you know, we will do uh, insurance. Um, so, you know, th th there's been some historic, but there's new areas that are coming up. And I was in the private sector, but Google uh, had bought DoubleClick um, and the two agencies. You know, it's who, who does this right, one? Right. So the statute under the, what's the Hart Scott Rodino law that deals with mergers gives 30 days to party. You know, parties cannot close a transaction for 30 days until the agencies review it. And then, you know, usually they'll take longer, but there's a first issue is 30 days. Uh, and that trigger, it wasn't until the 29th day that. Uh, the two agencies worked it out. So, you know, it's not good government when, when, when the two agencies do that. Hopefully we have the controls in place now where it, none, of, none of our clearances ta are taking that long, but part of that is because Joe and I are both sensitive to the issue. Well, you gotta be proactive too. I mean, when, the, when you, you can look down the road and see, you know, rather than waiting for a particular case to get to the, the last day, you know, you can look you forward and see Listen, we got this whole new set of technology challenges, and so how are we going to manage that? And I, as long as you have a, you know, again, it kind of it gets a little bit down to personal relationships as well. As it does. long as there aren't sharp elbows flying, you know, you can get in front of those issues, right? And, and largely that's how it has worked, and it's not a partisan issue. Google was in 2007, so you had, uh, you know, Debbie Majoris over at the FTC right. and Tom Barnett at the Antitrust Division, so two incredibly reasonable and competent people who were also good friends. So, you know, these things just happen yeah. because of the agency jurisdictions and, you know, we deal with those. Um, but one area that isn't good, and, you know, Senator Mike Lee and, and former Chairman Goodlatte had introduced a bill called the Smarter Act that the Antitrust Modernization Commission identified, and the administration supports this legislation. Uh, it was that, you know, so it's kind of by accident that one agency or another might review a particular merger. However, the legal standard for getting a preliminary injunction is different between the two agencies. So could you imagine if you're an investor and you're looking, well, what do you think the odds are of this merger getting approved or yet not getting approved? Well, it kind of depends on which agency right. reviews it. That's not or which right. agency reviews That's it. Not the well, right I don't way know. To do it. Yeah. Let's flip a coin and determine. And, <laughs> or, or forum shop. And you might have a billion dollar, you know, well, uh, you arbitrage. Could, you could theoretically kind of arrange your deal in a way that would go to you know, congressional committees do this all the time, right? They right. write their bill in a way to that's going to go to judiciary or go to, to commerce, but you could probably figure out a way to game the system. You could try to, and then sometimes it has happened. When I was in private practice, I certainly did that, uh, but not <laughs> successfully all the time. But it was something so you know, where it's, it's you know, at least congressional uh, systems, they have some <laughs> neutral principles of committee right, jurisdiction, right, right. and then you can game it here. You, you, you kind of don't because it really comes down to personality. So, you know, with that, with that other than that little minor area, the two agencies work. The, the issue of data and artificial intelligence poses, you know, two problems for us. Uh, first, data has been very pro-competitive in a lot of areas. They provide pro-consumer you know, benefits when a company, you know, good or bad, you know, when Netflix knows what you like and you don't like, it can promote to you a particular programming and 
that's not to pick on Netflix, but I think that's a positive thing. It says, hey, you liked, I don't know, Friends. Maybe you like Three's Company, and they're and both silly. This is silly. dating. This is yeah. dating. Yeah. Examples, man. <laughs> but I see the audience, and a few people might remember what Three's Company is here. <laughs> One of my favorite shows of all time. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm just surprised there's anybody in this audience. You usually think you put antitrust and patents together. That's the quickest way to empty a room. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> but uh, you guys are very kind. So, but the data on one side, we recognize the pro-competitive benefits. The challenge becomes how do we treat the data, for example, in a merger? And should we, as some people and legislators and presidential candidates have been arguing, should you force the sharing of that data that the company has invested in uh, by a competitor, you know, maybe a new competitor who wants to come in? Should we force people to have access to Coca-Cola's formula? Because right. without it, they can't compete. And we have taken our policy position as we view data as an asset class. So if two companies have two com you know, uh, data that are competing with each other in the same market, in a merger enforcement, we might request a divestiture of one of the data sets to somebody else to remain, so it's not anti-competitive. Right. However, in an enforcement of a, you know, a single firm conduct, we are very careful not to, you know, unless extraordinary cir circumstance presents itself, which I haven't seen yet, is to force the sharing of it when a company has you know, been smarter or, or invested in the collection of that data to help consumers do that. There might be policy reasons that Congress could say, look, maybe we should have a data protection regime uh, that you do this for 20 years and then after that, Congress, you know, you get in. They did that in the Hatch-Waxman context in 1984 dealing, which created the generic pharmaceutical industry. Right. Um, but there's many other areas or patents, you know, you do this for whatever, you know, right. 20 years. You draw on some policy lines. And, and yeah. disclose that. Right. So there could be policy reasons, but until there is that, we treat data as that. Where it poses a real challenge, it was artificial intelligence, when two companies, without agreeing with each other, might start setting pricing, make pricing decisions almost like collusion or be able to police each other. So I know that if Peter and I are in the same market, and let's say there's three of us, I know that if Peter lowers his price by 10%, my algorithm is immediately going to uh, lower Adjust, the price. Right. If you increase it, I will increase it. And we all do that. None of us have agreed with each other, so it's not necessarily a Sherman Section 1 violation where we would be granted you know, pinstripes courtesy of the federal government. But in that situation where you have artificial intelligence do that, it poses real challenges. Basically the same effect. And that yeah, yeah. is a real issue for us and for international enforcers. Great. Peter, before you go on, so yeah. uh, on, the, uh, on the data sets, it, fascinating issues, and illustrates actually your first question about uh, the, uh, whether patents and the like are pro-competitive or not. If you think about it, Secrecy generally drives to concentration uh, and uh, bigger growth within a smaller concentrated market. So if you think about uh, data as a very good example, uh, as we've mentioned, very, very difficult for the startups to compete when they have a m access to a much smaller data set as compared to the big guys right. who have huge amounts and then can utilize it and therefore can get huger and huger. Uh, so it further concentrates. Uh, and it is exactly what was happening in the Middle Ages before the, the American patent system where you concentrated wealth and concentrated resources. So secrecy in general drives towards that. Patents and, IP and copyrights and IP in general tend to um, uh, to, to, to uh, democratize, so to speak, the system. Um, and the question is, how do you do it when you have this very difficult nut to crack vis-a-vis -vis data, which, which is very difficult to not keep secret, really. Um, there are models out there. Uh, May can refer to the Hatch-Waxman. There is another form of, of protection that very few people talk about, but you know, when you think about pharmaceuticals and bio bi biologics, um, there is actual statutes for data protection of those. Five years for small molecules, so just normal drugs. Um, Twelve years for biologics, DNA type uh, 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 cures and, the, and treatments and the like. 
Um, it's not quite perfectly analogous, but this gives you some limited time protection of right. the data set itself, right. uh, but then it makes it available to the generics uh, to utilize. So we can try to think in some of those terms. Again, it's not, so it's you a, can't do it exactly the same. Right, it's but. a balancing process, and, and policy makers have to go through that, so good. Um, so I wanted to dive into a couple more controversial topics, not too controversial, but some controversial topics. Um, and the first, the first is probably way over my depth, so let me take a shot at it. So this is the area um, of dealing with standards essential patents. So many of you in the audience, raise your hand if you know what standard essential patents are. I just want to, okay, wow. so you are all a lot smarter than I am about this, so you can come up here and do this. Um, <laughs> So standards essential patent, for those of you who don't know, is, is basically when a patent is claiming an invention that must be used to comply with a technical standard, so like JPEG or something like that, and then people have to work around that standard. So it gets pretty complicated when you're trying to figure out, I mean, the standard study bodies are determining you know, which, which patents are essential um, and trying to stay you know, within the terms, well, I'm not going to get too technical on this, but anyway. So there's a lot of issues that come out here with, with that. And um, Macon uh, recently withdrew some guidance at the Department of Justice. And uh, Macon, I'd like you to kind of explain why, why you did that, what, what, what that was all about. Uh, well, uh, yeah, you've picked an area that is uh, uh, hotly debated right now. I kind of find it pretty simple. That could be because I'm a simpleton, is that it is, the, the issue is, you know, you have standard setting. The antitrust laws recognize the pro-competitive effects of creating interoperability and, and having standards in a certain area. I mean, could you imagine if you had a, you know, outlet for your phone charger and, you know, you had different kinds of outlets all throughout, I mean, forget about the country, but every other room or every building had a different standard. You know, you had the 110 standard and 220 down the road and the 330 in the other building. And you, could never, you would never know, but it's, it actually was very good for consumers that you have standardized some issues. Now, assuming that it doesn't compromise the technology that benefits the consumers. In those situations, you know, patent owners uh, make some commitments. Uh, some call it FRAND, some call it, call it RAND, whatever, fair, reasonable, non-discriminatory. Um, provisions under which they will license their patents to the users of that standard. And standards used to be, you know, these rooms where a whole bunch of techno geeks who are even more nerdy than Andre and I in the patents and antitrust worlds, but these are folks who were, you know, true engineers who would get together and, you know, almost like NIH peer-reviewed uh, committees where they would really hotly debate the technical merits of a standard and say, look, here's the way we should do it, and we should use this, and we should do that, and any one of our products might have a thousand patents on it, in a microprocessor, for example. Um, and different folks and say, okay, this is the best way to put this together, and it might read on this patent. As long as you disclose it up front, some people would hide the eight ball, but if you want to participate, you would disclose your patent. Say, I have this patent or application, which may not be public, and others. And I, I want to make it part of the standard. Uh, but I will promise to license this on a reasonable basis. Well, what the heck does that mean? I don't know. That's a contractual commitment that the patent owner gives. And a judge can find if you've been reasonable or not. A theory came by, you know, about 14 years ago uh, by, you know, a friend of mine who was a chief economist of the antitrust division out of Berkeley who was a consultant to one of the companies who happened to be a licensee in a patent licensing renewal fight. And they came up with this theory that it would be a violation of the antitrust laws if you violated your FRAND commitment. So a contractual obligation now gives rise to an antitrust violation. Well, that has real policy implications because that's not what Congress has said. And if you do not license it, and so let's say I say, hey, Peter, my beautiful chandelier is $10 to license if you want to copy it and go sell it. Um, you have to give me $10 per chandelier. And you say, well, that's not reasonable. And I go, well, I think it is. Look, Andre pays me 10 bucks and Dean pays me 10 bucks. Well, that, you're discriminated against me. I'm not gonna pay you. 
like, all right, well then, you can't sell these chandeliers, right? Uh, and I will sue you to bring a, you know, an injunction suit under the patent laws that Congress has provided pursuant to this Constitution. And you say, well, if you do that, you are now violating the antitrust laws for monopolization. And some cases have accepted. And you could imagine one of our greatest exports out of the United States has been antitrust law the last 40 years. We have 138 antitrust agencies as of count this morning. Um, there might be a couple of more in the last few hours. But these guys are finding it, hey, what a great thing we can do. There's, look, there's this you know, technology company. You know, I'm not saying there would be any xenophobia involved, but look at this. How great is this? We could get them, make them uh, take a, uh, a haircut, and you must, it'll be a violation of antitrust law if you have a standard essential patent and don't license it to them. And uh, the, whatever that was. That was, a, that was a standard essential patents protest. I think we've got somebody coming in off the balcony there. So the, the issue becomes the bargaining leverage that the licensee and the patent owner might have and what that commitment means. Because if it becomes an antitrust violation, I cannot bring an injunctive uh, action against you. Right. Um, I mean, my patent almost, you know, I, I don't have the exclusionary right. So I will now starve because I don't get the royalty revenues for which I need to either pump into more R&D or recoup the investments I've made in the past. But if, so, but you benefit, and the, you know, the, the basis from that is, you know, you paying zero to maybe the $10. Right. And a judge will determine, however, you know, the, the incredible uh, genius that they might be with, you know, three clerks who just came out of law school who are also geniuses, but they will determine what that price should be rather than the markets, okay? So now the other side, the licensees would argue, well, if you didn't, now I will suffer because I'm in the business of selling chandeliers and I can't. So now I suffer from that. That's the policy argument. So how did the guidance affect that balance? So the guidance that in 2013 that the DOJ and the PTO had, you know, put their thumb on the scale of that debate, saying that you know, giving an injunction uh, could violate, could harm consumers and competition, kind of code words for violations of antitrust law, which I don't think is sound economics. And that's not what the you know, Supreme Court has never ruled on this yet. I'll find the right case. Um, and hopefully they'll settle it one way or the other, and hopefully they'll be reasonable and rational in this. But uh, it is an area where, again, uh, unlike your typical Washington regulator saying this should not be an antitrust violation until or unless Congress says it should be, which I hope they don't. But it's causing an international debate on this and devaluing intellectual property through which I think it devalues the incentive, which you take it a little bit further, it actually devalues competition because the Shamterian, you know, dynamic competition will die. Okay. So, uh we got to move on to other topics, but Andre, I don't know if you have any thoughts on kind of PTO's role in this area or if you have any, anything to add to what Macon said on SEPs. Uh, well, uh, this is a lengthy topic, yes. but um, uh, so, so the 2013 statement was DOJ and PTO in combination. DOJ has withdrawn now. We are looking at the issue and uh, trying to assess uh, what, uh, uh, what uh, the approach uh, should be. Uh, whatever we do, we have to make sure that um, we incentivize, if we incentivize anything at all, we incentivize good behavior um, and that we do not uh, somehow purposely or by, by you know, co by, by um, uh, pure luck um, create either a holdout or a hold up situation. And um, uh, we want to have a balanced approach that tries to avoid either one of those uh, bad outcomes. Okay, I'm gonna skip a couple of other uh, uh, controversial topics because I'm pretty sure that <laughs> folks in the audience are gonna bring these up, but I wanted to just kind of end this, this section here by talking, going a little bit bigger picture and, and address to you, first of all, Andre, kind of how does the U.S. keep its edge in innovation? So when you look at intellectual property, um, I've heard you talk about before that, that um, that the number of patents being filed in China are far outpacing U.S. patents currently, uh, and that the tra trajectory is even worse. Um, so they're going to be going through the roof while we, we kind of 
you know, go along at the same rate we've been doing in quite some time. So what can the U.S. do to respond to that? Um, first of all, is that the right metric to look at in terms of are we in trouble or not? Uh, and secondly, what can we do to respond to the, to the, to the, um, the threat? Yeah, so China has gone through the roof. Uh, right now, th there are four times as many filings at the, uh, by Chinese at the Chinese Patent Office than um, Americans at the American Patent Office. Um, and um, uh, so, so, and that, is that the right measure? Patents are a measure, they're a leading indicator of where the innovation is and, and how much innovation there is. Uh, I do think it's a very good metric, but you don't have to trust the patents only. You can look at almost any other metric that's out there. Uh, at, uh, you can look at the number of peer-reviewed articles, articles, technical and scientific articles in peer-reviewed journals file, um, published worldwide. China is ahead now. Uh, you can look at the number of standard uh, standards organization committees that are being chaired. China chairs more than we do now. Um, uh, you can look at the number of technical engineering science uh, graduates every year. It's not even close anymore. Um, China's well, well, well ahead. And um, I want to emphasize that it's not, just, it's not just that the United States is in competition with China. Obviously, China is um, a huge uh, uh, country with four times as many people as we have, and they're very focused on innovation um, um, and, and the like, so that's definitely a threat. Uh, but it's well beyond that. The whole world is innovating now, from the smallest countries. Take Singapore, for example, very innovative. Israel, very innovative. Um, and um, uh, Switzerland, and then everything in between, Korea, so what, Japan. So what do we do? Um, so, uh, we, um, so, so, so there are several things. First and foremost, I really think it's important to recognize this. And I think people need to uh, understand, in the United States, uh, at every level, we all need to understand that just because we are the techno have been for the past 100, 150 years the technological leaders in the world and still are today, it's not a guarantee that we will continue to be there 20 years from now, 50 years from now, and in the next technological uh, uh, revolution. That is very important for everybody to understand. Look, very little discussed at all is that China, just a couple of months ago, landed a spacecraft on the dark side of the moon and moved it around, controlled from Earth, okay? And people need to, to, to understand that, that, that they are out there. Um, so what do we do? So that's number one. Second, we want to make sure that um, our policies um, whether it's IP, whether there is just uh, investment in innovation and the like in the private sector, in the government, um, are geared towards encouraging more and more and more innovation. There are qu quite a few voices out there that are saying there's lots of U.S. patents out there, there's lots of U.S. innovation out there, the patent system in the United States has grown and it has at the compounded rate in the t relevant technical areas at 4%. The Chinese patents have grown at 24% year over year. Um, so compound that rate. So we need, whatever we're doing, we need to do much more of it. We need to get more of our people involved in innovation. We cannot compete with China on the number of overall population. So therefore, we need a higher percentage of our people to innovate. Um, we just released a study of the PTO that shows that of U.S. inventors today, as named on American patents, only 12% are women. We're basically competing with a hand, one hand tied behind our backs. So we need more women to innovate. We need, uh, and, and other minorities, and we need, and, and underprivileged uh, individuals. We need m folks from a broader spectrum of the national geography to innovate. Innovation right now is highly concentrated in the United States mostly on the coasts. You can think about Silicon Valley and the like, and a few other spots. Broad swaths of the United States is left out of this ecosystem. So we need to do much more of that. So I put it in three major categories. We need to identify our priorities as a nation. We need to uh, inspire people to innovate, and we need to empower people to innovate at higher and higher rates. 
Great. So the last uh, comment here before we go to questions, Macon. Um, so talk to me a little bit about um, so obviously antitrust. I mean, there's a lot of issues, bankruptcy, antitrust, so those types of policies are critical in terms of accomplishing some of the things that Andre is talking about. What are the differences between U.S. antitrust, Chinese antitrust, um, and how do other Chinese um, rules, laws, regulations operate to either give them an advantage or, or disadvantage in the international marketplace? So Chinese antitrust enforcement is in a flux right now. So their anti-monopoly law, as they call it, is, um, uh, is about 10 years old. It was put in place in 2008, so 11 years old uh, now. Uh, just about six months ago, so they had created three different agencies, the Ministry of Commerce and uh, a couple, two other agencies. They seem to have a little bit more wisdom than we do, since we have 53 antitrust agencies in this country. Um, they combined, after doing a study, they combined them all into one, uh, the state administration of mergers or you know, monopoly regulation, I think it's called, SAMR. And so they're doing, they are at the infancy, but fortunately they have done uh, a lot of good of moving towards a market-based approach for, uh, for antitrust enforcement. To the extent there have been some stories saying that, oh, they're uh, you know, deploying their antitrust enforcement in a way to disadvantage um, foreign competitors. Uh, we are keeping a close eye on them. We are in negotiations with them, uh, as also as broad, the broader trade discussions that are going right. on. You work with the USTR. And with the trade reps issues, office, right? yeah. your former agency, yep. Yep. and, uh, and I, I guess my former agency at one point. It, it's, they're doing some great work over there, and we'll see what it results, but antitrust is part of the discussion there, um, and I hope that they stay in line and continue. We've, um, uh, you know, provided technical assistance wherever we can. We send folks. In fact, Roger Alford, my international deputy, is there now and just gave a speech yesterday. Um, the challenge becomes, and I'd be curious to know in the patent office, is how many of those patents uh, are state-owned by, the, by their federal laboratories or companies that are owned uh, by, their, by their government. And that would, should give us an indication of what kind of benefits they might have as opposed to you know, our state-owned yeah. or government. Of course, you know, federal labs and NIH and others uh, file for patents, but relatively, I, I'd be curious to know what that is. Do you know what, that? What, what difference does it make? It's a centralized uh, communist regime, <laughs> and um, hard to tell the difference. But I don't have off the top, if you're yeah. thinking like Huawei, for example, I don't know if you're considering that as a private company. It's hard to separate. I'll leave to other divisions of the Justice Department to determine that. But <laughs> so, All right. Well, that's a good, well, it's an, it's an excellent point. It's, it's really, and we could have a whole session on, on that because it's kind of apples and oranges. But that gets into the trade discussion of, you know, are they unfairly right. subsidizing various parts of the industry that we can't really compete with? Right. So that's right. an important one. So, so it's good. very quickly, I know a lot of people have questions. Very quickly on that point, um, there are two separate issues when it comes to China. One is their unfair uh, practices when it comes to IP, and there's certainly uh, a lot of them, and the administration is very focused on uh, on addressing that, and that's a fantastic thing. Separate from that, or in addition to that, even if they were to stop all the unfair stuff, um, they are doing their own innovation, and we can't lose track of that either. Yeah, good. Okay, so going back to the era of Three's Company, I'm going to be John McLaughlin, uh, and <laughs> going to be ruthless uh, in terms of making sure that the questioners ask a question and, and do not give a speech because we only have about 10 minutes. So quick questions and we're going to cycle through these like bam, 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 like McLaughlin group. Okay, first question. Um, what do you see the role of the patent office in evaluating the patents? Should the examiner review the patent to determine whether it's accepted or rejected? Or should the examiner try to help the inventor make the best patent? I want to give you a little context on this. This is very important in the field of medicine, in, in methods and biomarkers, where there's a lot of controversies and there's billions of dollars involved, and the small inventor doesn't have a chance against the foreign companies because of huge litigation costs. And the claims in medicine are inherently ambiguous. It's not like a device where it's a wide range Great. of possibilities. Okay. So if a claim is written and the patent examiner says it's too broad, does he have it? 
duty to tell the inventor how to make the best claim or just an acceptable claim, or okay. vice versa. If the claim right. is too narrow, should the court have, have, have accept it or offer a bigger claim? Got it. Thank you. Um, uh, so it's a good question. Um, it's, uh, the answer is a little bit of both. So I believe that the uh, first obligation of the patent examiner is to make sure that the patent application specification, including and the claims and so on, comply with all the statutory requirements and reject it if it doesn't. But in addition, the patent examiner should help the applicant to the extent possible draft appropriately scoped claims, good claims. Help them get good claims that are commensurate with the invention and the disclosure of the specification. Great. And that, and that will withstand challenge down the road. Next. Uh, the issues that you've been talking about clearly would benefit from um, uh, high quality uh, economic analysis. Uh, I've been doing off and on review of patent regulations about 15 years and a consistent pattern is that the patent office does not do uh, any economic analysis. Uh, it doesn't write regulatory impact analyses. It does all these pretty large regulations without, without much at all. Uh, so well, Andre, what, what, do, you, what do, do you say to that? To, is that true? What are you doing to try to, to institute that capacity to do economic analysis to inform decision making along these lines? Yeah, so we do have a chief economist. We have a whole office of the chief economist with several economists on staff. We do quite a bit of analysis when it comes to intellectual property uh, in the United States. Um, uh, so I can, and, and, and we have folks from the outside who come in. For example, on, uh, we just have a couple of folks who just joined us. We call them Edison scholars. These are academics who come work uh, with us uh, for about a year or so. So we, we have, we're quite active in that area. We publish reports. So just the most recent report is, uh, that I've mentioned is with respect to uh, the participation of women um, in the innovation ecosystem. You can look at the report at USPTO.gov. That was handled by the chief economist's office. We have also done studies by our economists in conjunction with the Department of Commerce economists um, on the um, uh, the uh, a volume of IP industries in the United States. For example, what percentage of American GDP is driven by intellectual property and the like. So we've done those studies and recently updated them um, as well. Uh, we've done studies on the value of a patent, trying to quantify the value of a patent to a startup and showing the great benefits uh, of those. So uh, these are just some examples. We do quite a bit of it. Great. Good. Trish? Okay. Uh, thank you, Trish Pauletta, Harris, Walter, and Granis. Um, I'm in the telecom practice group, so I want to Yeah, I have to apologize that we have, well, I think most of what we were talking about today is highly relevant to the telecom Absolutely. world. We haven't had telecom specific discussions, so I apologize for that, but you've got no, your no, chance. No apology needed, and, you know, because I've enjoyed uh, Mr. Yansu's comments on AI, you know, both this year and last year, but you know, there's been a lot in the press, at least in the telecom press, about government policy for 5G. I'm not talking about government-run networks. I think that was, you know, answered, asked and answered, that's over. But, you know, there, obviously there is a dimension of keeping out vendors that pose national security risks. So that's kind of Macon's, you know, area. Uh, discussion of having increased presence of U.S. folks on standard-setting bodies, and obviously that's Peters and Macon, all of you guys. And AI, right, we have to, you know, 5G is a great way to facilitate AI, right? So there's interagency discussions, of course, on broadband through the American Broadband Initiative, but are there interagency discussions, you know, with all your jurisdictions and others on 5G policy and how to keep the U.S. in the lead technically so we could, you know, have broad deployment of 5G in a safe and secure manner? Uh, we have been involved, you know, uh, at the White House and the NEC, NSC, uh, sponsored discussions uh, on, to the extent it relates to us with respect to 5G. We've had staff that coordinate with that. We obviously work closely with the Federal Communications Commission on a number of areas in addition to being kind of their Hobbs Act attorneys that's been delegated to us. So we have the great pleasure of defending a lot of their rules once they get sued uh, for their rules on behalf of the United States government. Um, 
so we work very closely, uh, not only on the litigation, but on policies, including mergers uh, that might have some impact in that world. Um, so there's you know, some of that, you know, that we've been in discussions with NIST and the PTO and others uh, on some other policy related. So depending on the issue, uh, I think there's interagency yeah, I, groups that I, work I with I would it. just add my two cents to kind of bigger picture um, than just your question, which is that international standard setting bodies, both writ narrowly and in large, so I would say something like privacy, for example, um, you know, by not, um, that, that others may get out in a, setting a standard uh, in front of the United States um, in a way that's not necessarily before uh, you know, the ITU or something like that or, or other, other standard setting uh, bodies. But I think uh, the administration is acutely aware of the need for the United States to provide leadership in all of these areas. And so we are you know, focused in a number of different ways. So you know, again, there's an AI working group. Macon talked about some of the areas that we do. I'm dealing with privacy, a number of other folks in different areas. So yes, I mean, I think US leadership in the world in terms of this is really critical. And if we don't provide leadership, someone else will. And we won't end up being in a very good place. So. So, making it may be that antitrust and IP are a buzzkill for a lot of people, but for me, I w woke up looking <laughs> forward to this panel. So, thank you. Uh, this is great. And you guys are great. Very grateful for all three of you gentlemen and the important work you're doing, which is so important to our economy, hugely important. So, my question is injunctions. Post eBay, it's become very difficult if you're a licensor to get an injunction. There used to be a presumption of an injunction, or arguably there might have been. There's now a presumption arguably against injunctions. What impact, if any, do you see that happening, uh, having on innovation, and what needs to happen in the jurisprudence or legislation surrounding this? You know, I think, you know, the eBay issue is one where, you know, that's a Supreme Court ruling. Um, I actually think that the court uh, as a matter of policy, interpret that properly. Um, some people might be surprised uh, by that viewpoint because they might think by strong intellectual property views might think that they should get an automatic injunction. That's not what Congress laid out. Uh, you know, there's a equitable relief that is provided that the Supreme Court said you have to look at the four-part test. To the extent district courts of the federal circuit may not be applying this, those standards properly, uh, that should be an area of concern because it actually does change the balance of the incentive of intellectual property versus uh, the user. But uh, if there is, you know, if you meet the standards of irreparable harm and all that, uh, that, that should, then they should be granting those. But I think the law, the Supreme Court interpretation of the law as it's, that is written by Congress is, now of course Congress could change that but you hope, like in any other part of the law, that the lower courts actually apply it properly and are interpreting what the Supreme Court and Chief Justice Roberts said in that case uh, the right way. Okay, so, uh, just very, very briefly. briefly. So the Supreme Court found that when the Constitution says exclusive rights uh, to the inventors uh, can be remedied with non-exclusive rights. Um, uh, so uh, you can see perhaps why the lower courts are having somewhat of a difficult time figuring out how to draw those lines because um, um, uh, of, of that uh, potential ambiguity. What is absolutely critical is that the courts apply the Supreme Court's decision appropriately and carefully because otherwise if you end up in a situation where the de facto outcome is uh, a presumption against injunctions to begin with, um, then you incentivize bad behaviors in the marketplace. And instead of, for example, lowering the amount of litigation, um, you potentially end up in a situation where you disincentivize settlements and license agreements, and as a result, you increase the, the amount of litigation and multiply the costs on the economy and the burdens on the economy, and that's just one example. So careful balance is important. Great, well, listen, I, I apologize for the people in line. I, I've got to get you out of here for lunch. Um, I promise to uh, 
get you. Otherwise, you're going to be cut off. There will be no food. No, I'm just kidding. So I just want to thank our two panelists, and Macon and Andre, for a terrific presentation today. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thank you. All right. That was a lot of fun. Great.